Hello there, my very good friends. I'm Andy Murray from What Culture. And I'm Michael Sidgwick from What Culture. And on today's wrestling news, we are going to cover a spate of AEW injury stories relating to some of the biggest stars in the company. We're going to talk about what AEW's locker room morale is like after Full Gear 2021. And on top of that, we've got some interesting comments from CM Punk on the mythical, magical, casual wrestling fan. Let's kick things off by talking Kenneth Omega. He's pretty banged up. Pretty banged up is Kenny, uh, <laughs> the poor guy, obviously, put Hangman Page over in the main event of Full Gear. Big moment for AEW, big organic homegrown built to over the course of two and a half, three years. Huge thing, but the guy was working hurt. His shoulders, they sound, uh, they sound pretty messed up. Dave Meltzer reporting on this on Wrestling Observer Radio after the pay-per-view, uh, saying that sh Kenny's shoulders are hurt to the extent that he can't lift heavy weights at the moment. But Kenny has told Dave personally that he can like still lift the bar and he can still perform and everything else. It's not an ideal situation to be in when your finisher is putting someone on your shoulders, though. Uh, on top of this, in a video, like this like 50 minute video of him having like this chiropractic adjustment thing being done uh, to him with Dr. Bo Hightower, uh, Kenny essentially revealed that he's been dealing with vertigo as well in the ring for 2018, saying he's had to learn how to wrestle in a spinning room and everything else. He talked a little bit about the shoulder, saying he felt better after the adjustment and everything else, but well, this guy, I mean, when you consider how banged up he is and how beaten up he is, it just kind of makes his past few years even more remarkable, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I'm a huge Kenny Omega fan. He's my favorite wrestler currently and of all time. So I take no pleasure whatsoever in saying this. But realistically, if you look at the influx of talent in All Elite Wrestling signed this year, how stacked that main event scene is. It's essentially an all-star league at this point. It feels like there's no better time for him to be written off. Yeah written out storylines to finally do a long-term correction for these injuries that while he's obviously still been dealing with, he's still been working to, as you just pointed out, an absolutely incredible level. We knew from the events of Full Gear that there are a plethora, I love Taz for reintroducing that word into the lexicon, by the way, go. plethora, it's absolutely <laughs> brilliant. There are a plethora of potential storyline directions in which they can take this elite the latest chapter of the elite civil war yeah. or friction story um, with the uh, young books alluding to at least a face turn. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I thought the match on at full gear was incredible. You can't really tell that he's banged up because he's so great at modifying everything he does. He's so great at pacing a match, but ultimately, it just feels like there's no better time and he's never been more ready for an actual long-term yeah. corrective shoulder surgery. Um, but we shall see. Yeah, we'll see what happens. He's got the match with uh, Vikingo in Mexico on the 7th of December. Um, but after that, maybe, who knows, maybe he's thinking of it. But yeah, there's so much you can do with that elite storyline. Adam Cole maybe ascending to some kind of leadership role in his absence is very compelling. Uh, the Bucks, obviously, yes, like you said, being more sympathetic towards Hangman. Uh, Kevin Steen potentially coming in, some Mount Rushmore stuff, there's all kinds of interesting storyline possibilities. So yeah, I mean, you'd rather have him take some time off and heal up than shorten his career. So let's see what he does. But the thing is, if he goes away for a while and everyone misses him loads yeah. and he comes back as something approaching the 2018, 2017 version of himself, won't that mean the pops haven't run out? The pops never run out, do they? Contrary to Twitter. Uh, Two more AW wrestlers dealing with injuries at the moment. Uh, not necessarily things that happened at Full Gear for Eddie Kingston, who's the first person we're going to talk about here. Uh, he's had an accumulation of shoulder problems, uh, writes PW Insider's Mike Johnson. So Eddie Kingston and Malachi Black, who's the other person I'm talking about here, were forced to pull out of the big event convention in New York City on Sunday. That is, of course, the day after Full Gear. Now, it was announced by Northeast Wrestling, who were due to host Kingston at the event, that this was due to an injury he suffered while wrestling CM Punk, but Johnson has clarified that it's an accumulation. There's no word on what Black is suffering from, but he teamed with Andrade El Idolo to face Cody Rhodes and Pac at the pay-per-view as well. So. No words on whether or not these lads are going to be missing any time, but man, it would really suck if Eddie had to, specifically at this moment, right? Yeah, this absolutely. Momentum. There's no real way to editorialize this other than it sucks because yeah. Eddie Kingston is on the absolute form of his life. His incredible work throughout the years has finally been recognized on the big stage on which he's absolutely smashed it. Promos, angles, matches, like a really distinct, different kind of match that's such 
a refreshing yeah. breath of fresh air in All Elite Wrestling, just expanding that um, the range all the more. Um, so yeah, it sucks for him, and I really hope that he doesn't uh, miss any significant amount of time. And that's not to say anything of Malachi Black, who has really developed a following. Mm -hmm. He's really proven um, that there is life after WWE's cursed main roster there's nothing else to say other than it sucks and we wish them the best yeah hope they're not out too long if they are indeed out at all and we will update you on their situation as updates emerge uh right let's let's talk some books we've got the offer here of our brand new one of course uh becoming all elite the rise of AEW. these are available on our web store at whatculture.bigcartel.com link in the description down there you order now you'll get them for christmas international shipping is available yes yes indeed but your brand new book michael sidgwick uh charting AEW, going back decades Decades and decades, the roots of everything that led to this promotion rising to prominence. We've got a reprint of your 2017 book, yeah. uh, Development Hell, the NXT story, that's been reprinted. You can get that in a bundle with the AEW book as well. And on top of that, we have updated our 505 wrestling matches to see before you die. 606, because since we published it, a lot of good stuff has happened. There's also a lot of old stuff that we forgot. So we've thrown that in, including such classics as Shelly Martinez versus Rebel. But yes. Get them all on the web store. We've got the man right here, the offer, tremendous stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Spent loads and loads and loads of time on those books. And this latest one I'm particularly proud of. It's going by, it's really good. Yeah, I'm gonna read it over Christmas. You should as well. Next story, backstage morale, AEW. Full Gear was very well received. Everyone seemed to really enjoy it. So it won't come as a big surprise to learn that backstage morale is high in AEW at the moment. Uh, this is from Matt Menz and Drew Zarian, uh, who spoke to a source in AEW over the weekend, got the following quote, morale is very high with the locker room. The investment AEW has made in its future stars is paying dividends. That point about future stars is interesting considering Hangman won the title, excellent stuff, great big moment. That was the major talking point coming out of the pay-per-view. But also, if you look at the cards, like people who are in positions of prominence on that lineup, you got Sammy Guevara, MJF, Darby Allen, Jungle Boy, Britt Baker, bunch of other people. Uh, a core of younger wrestlers that the company has tried to elevate and build into stars and will continue to do so. Um, so yeah, I'm not surprised by this at all, but it's always nice to hear a locker room morale story that's positive because often when you, you do these things, the more salacious one is everyone hates everything and everything sucks, but it just sounds like a happy, harmonious locker room and that's good. It does, absolutely. The main editorial insight I can apply here is that even if you weren't on the card, if you're a Dante Martin or if you're another emerging breakthrough talent who's got the potential to one day pay-per-view, I personally, if I was them, would be thinking, well, of course I can because look what's happened between All Out and full gear. If there were any rumblings of, not just discontent, but like paranoia that um, an Adam Cole or a Danielson or a Punk is going to steal your spot, they've told the perfect story at the perfect time between MJF and Darby Allen. Mm -hmm. What they've done is they've recognised, right, what we need to do is to not just solely rely on these hot new buzzworthy signings. And they've crafted a story about the four pillars, mm -hmm. two of which had an absolute barnstormer of an opening match. Um, at the pay-per-view and it just feels like it's an actual meritocracy if you work hard if you um, use the uh, platform of expression that you've been provided by Tony Khan and the AEW management team then you can get over and you'll be rewarded for getting over with what was I believe the third longest match on the card the opener is in front of the hottest crowd um, yeah as I said if you're MJF and Darby Allen, if you had any rumblings of ah oh Christ Danielson and CM Punk are coming in that completely faded away. And as I said, like, it goes further down the chain. If you're a Dante Martin, you're thinking, well, if I put in the work and continue to improve, I will get rewarded, there evidently. You yeah, there you go. A very attractive proposition must be for any young wrestler coming in. And we obviously look forward to seeing how these people develop and become main eventers and everything else and draws in their own right. It uh, must be a very rewarding experience for those people to be involved in that system. Final story of the day comes from the uh, post Full Gear media scrum. Uh, which is always interesting, particularly when you've got guys like CM Punk uh, speaking on this. One of the questions that Punk was asked during this or was uh, concerning like fan overlap. Do you think WWE fans that followed you before have come over? What do you think of the con contrast between the two live audiences that you've performed in front of on a mainstream level? He offered the following quote on that. I definitely think there's overlap. I don't know if everybody who is a WWE fan came over here specifically just to watch me, but what I do recognize in front of an AEW audience is an audience that I used to wrestle in front of prior to the WWE, it's the wrestling fans. And he continued speaking about the mythical, I, I say mythical, 
capital C, capital F, casual fan. Um, people talk about trying to get casual viewers, but I don't think there are any casual fans left anymore. My opinion, maybe I'm wrong. Uh, maybe someone in TNT is going to get mad uh, that I'm saying this or that I'm of this opinion. But you know, our fans are wrestling fans and we give them wrestling. So the casual fan argument is uh, a constant one that goes on, particularly when it comes to how can people attract viewers? How can we draw larger audiences in and everything else? Too often, I think, it becomes almost like a straw man thing of, well, I don't like this aspect about the program. This guy's too small. We need bigger guys to attract the casual fan. This guy's not a big enough name. We need bigger names to attract the casual fan. How are they going to know about this indie history between CM Punk and Eddie Kingston? Ah, the casual fan will be confused. It's kind of a fiery debate. What's your take on it? My take on it is that because in podcasts and shoot interviews and sometimes even on television, We've had extremely boring, tedious, washed up management and creative figures from the turn of the century. I will mm -hmm. leave it at that. I think you know who I'm talking about. Talk about ratings and ratings and ratings and ratings. And because they talk about ratings and ratings and ratings, because what they used to get and used to generate, I mean, Stone Cold Steve Austin and The Rock used to generate them, yeah. but you know, it's all about who wrote the stories. Isn't oh, it? Of course. Because they've been talking about this for so long, I think there's a misapplication of standards. And what I mean by that is, People think, oh, AEW is only getting a million or is only doing such and such in this demo that we've only just heard of, what a load of bollocks that is, incidentally, that I think they think that, all oh, right, okay, well, it's not doing seven million, therefore it's a complete... <laughs> it's a million, area. yeah. And, you know, there's so much different, so many different viewing options these days. Mm -hmm. The television industry is transformed completely. You should be grateful for that if you're one of these bad faith mutants who talk about this. Otherwise, there would be no WWE yeah. if you look at the um, fan reception versus um, corporate driven revenue streams. But these are all very broad, sweeping conversations that are yeah. too complex for a news video. Basically, the TV industry's changed. Mm -hmm. and you can probably thank 20 years of rot and poison for casual fans to be chased off. I just think there's this thing, again, just to finally put a, a underscore on this point. The lapsed attitude era fans are just not going to come back. It's yeah. just not going to happen. Yeah. And it's not a failure of AEW to bring back some six million people who've simply moved on with their lives, probably because they watched uh, a lot of wrestlers being rubbish in 2003-04 onwards. Yeah. And these people left the sport 20 years ago. It's kind of, you know, your life can change a lot. It's kind of a hard sell to come back to what you were doing 20 years ago. I used to listen ago. to Papa Roach 20 years ago. I still do. I haven't evolved at all, as you can probably tell. Uh, Twitter, I, I don't. Twitter questions. Let's get to those before we dive into new metal for some reason. Spine shank, they were good. Uh, shout out to Cold Chamber. The Land 5000. <laughs> oh God, bombshell. Hey, Dudley boys. Uh, the AEW dude uh, asks the following. Uh, good morning, legends. Capital L, thank you very much. Uh, now that Hangman is champion, what are your thoughts about him becoming the franchise player and holding on to the belt against Brian Danielson? Or are we looking at the first transitional Champion. This is an interesting one because I think in the office a lot of us had Miro pegged to beat Brian Danielson and maybe serve as like a speed bump type first defense for Hangman towards the end of the year. But what do you reckon now that Danielson's the guy to challenge? I like the fact that people are asking the question. That yeah. means there'll be loads of drama in what should be an absolutely classic match. I really can't wait for it. Awesome. Um, I've always been a little bit undecided on whether he heel should take it off him straight away, first pay per view defense. You know, further the idea that oh, just as he makes it, he loses it and his anxieties come to the surface again and he has to go on another long-term arc. If you watch the story beat play out brilliantly, in my opinion, at full gear, there was no, oh, can I do this conflict or melodrama or shocked kick out face. Hangman Page throughout 25 minutes played the role of a guy who was just there. Mm -hmm. He was mentally right. He didn't doubt himself for a second. The only things that threatened to take away his night were Don Callis and Kenny Omega entering a great performance, but he didn't do 40 minutes of, oh, can I do this? Yeah. Like the guy believes yeah. in himself now, that was the key story beat. Um, it was kind of anti-melodramatic in this really great way that I didn't personally anticipate, so I really can't see them going in that direction at all. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, you saw a lot of fantasy booking scenarios play out on social media afterwards uh, and various other platforms talking about, ah, you should lose it in a week, you should lose it in a month or whatever. Um, but, you know, it's such a complex character, such an interesting journey this Hangman character's been on, so 
We'll see what plays out. I currently would like to see him hold it until at least Revolution. Let's not be cruel. Let's not be cruel. Let's let the hangman. He believes in himself now. Yeah, exactly. That's the, a, that's the new story because that's the one that we should take away. He's a transformed man. Let's uh, get another question here from Daniel Pearson. Uh, real simple one. What would be your ultimate Forbidden Door match? Uh, his is Ricochet versus Will Ospreay versus Dante Martin, which is insane. No restrictions, gloves are off, any promotion. What have you got? I appreciate it's a big picture thing to just throw at you, but absolutely. Drop it. Um, Kenny Omega has worked a lot of the New Japan crew, so I would necessarily put my favourite wrestler in it. I would do Brian Danielson versus Hiroshi Tanahashi. I know they've worked before, but they've both improved by orders yeah. of magnitude subsequent to that. So either Brian Danielson. Uh, versus Tanahashi or Brian Danielson versus Okada. The craft in both of those would be off the charts. Uh, my, 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 my mind's happening on Wednesday. Yeah, the, the Andy Murray offering match. Uh, the Butcher and Tomohiro Ishii are going to be in the ring at the same time. What more could I possibly want? Uh, our final question comes from friend of the channel, Darren, who asks the following. It's a simple one here. Uh, good morning, you guys. Uh, as Adam Wilborn is on the cover of the Jungle Boy theme song. I mean, look at that. Look at that, it's literally him. Adam Wilborn is Baltimore. I think Wilborn's a bit wackier than that. Yeah, this guy's got a, like a gun holster and stuff. I've never seen Wilborn carrying a pistol around, but uh, I've lost my train of thought here. What is your current favorite wrestling theme music? Mine is obviously Jungle Boy's theme. Jungle Boy's is like, it's an objectively great theme because as soon as he comes out, the whole building's going to whoa, whoa, whoa. Um, uh, man, like, I, I, I don't want to be the Homer guy and go, hey, the Butcher and the Blaze Beam, but, but it's awesome. It's just a great metal song. Uh, but I, in recent weeks, I've really grown to love, you know, the Kazi Ninare, all these other great ones. I've really grown to love Brian Danielson's one recently. When he came out to hip hop at All Out, I was like, don't know about this vibe. This is this is not necessarily Danielson, but it's got a nice stomp to it. Now that he's a bit more of an asshole as well in the ring, I think it fits him well. I mean, strictly speaking, because I'm an absolute indie rock nerd, Orange Cassidy is because I love Pixies. But in terms of, I mean, it works perfectly for the character, but in terms of something that really fires me up and gets me absolutely on board for a great professional wrestling match right now, um, and it's fluid, but it has to be Danielson's. Yeah. <laughs> like, the trap works inexplicably yeah. well. I love the, the new Lucha Brothers one as well. I think, like, we disagreed on the original. This one, it's just so booming and so imposing and forbidding and then Alex Sabranes comes out. <laughs> I, 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 God, bless, God bless him. I like him, but it's, it's a weird contrast. Mikey sure. Ruckus dropped a preview of the Own Cup theme. Oh, it's so awesome. Which had the most incredibly accurate and yet new, updated Silver Vision Coliseum yeah. video early 90s vibes. Yeah. Ah, oh, God, I can't wait for that to drop. It's so sick. Check out that, that tracking of it if you've not seen it before. It'll be out there somewhere. It's great stuff. Mikey Ruckus is doing some really good stuff with these themes. It's yet another thing. It's the same things like MJF, Darby Allen, Dante Martin, like Omega, Punk, Danielson. You've got Mikey Ruggs thinking, oh, Tony Khan just fell in love with licensed themes. Better just make loads of great ones myself. Yeah. And then there's a perfect balance. Yeah, it's absolutely tremendous stuff. Anyway, thank you for joining us today on this news video. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter, what Culture WWE. Send us your questions, angry comments, abuse, everything. Less abuse, we will block you. Yeah. <laughs> oh, there he is. You can follow Sidgwick at M. Um, Sidgwick. Uh, you can follow me at Andy H. Murray. If you send me abuse, I'll just block you. Uh, the H today stands for Hangman, because we're happy for him. Good for him. It was nice. See you later.